So today uh, I decided to um, use a little bit more slides uh, because yesterday I realized uh, we go a little bit uh, too slow with the tablet. Uh, so here I have uh, collected a few formulas uh, just to make a summary of what we had also yesterday. So um, I, I, here are some basic formula and they, approx they approximately correct for uh, relativistic or non-relativistic particles, which yesterday probably didn't give you uh, exactly in this form. So this, uh, for the density, I think I derived, and then you have these uh, G star defined, um, of course, with the sum of all possible contribution to the energy density. In this case, of course, it's only for one particle. And uh, you see here, you have either uh, the boson on the fermions with the different factors. And the, uh, and the, uh, the same in the same limit, of course, the number density, you see it's just given again by something proportional to the temperature cubed. Uh, and here the factors in front again are, are connected to the integral of the exponential and they are actually numerical factors, uh, which are here xi of three is, is approximately one. Um, in the case of the non-relativistic particle, as we have seen, uh, we have instead uh, that the density is just the mass times the number density, and uh, the number density in that case is suppressed, and here is again the expression, in the case I can assume uh, dilute gas and the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution in the, instead of the Fermi-Dirac or Bose-Einstein distribution. And uh, here I have added also the chemical potential, just if you have it, but as, a, as usual, we will put it to zero for the case of the um, WIMP. And uh, you see that this suppression uh, E to the minus M over T is exactly what uh, really suppresses the density uh, when you have a, a particle which is non-relativistic uh, compared to a relativistic particle. And uh, therefore, uh, you have uh, um, the, we will see later on, the behavior which uh, drops. Uh, so the number density of a particle drops uh, as long uh, as it becomes non-relativistic. Uh, and you can, uh, as long also as you can keep up the equilibrium. And then, of course, I gave you also yesterday these two formulas about the, uh, the entropy. And uh, here is, again, the sum of the degrees of freedom. Similarly to what you define for the energy density, you can also define this G star GS uh, for the entropy uh, instead of G star. And you see here, that again, you can, in principle, also accommodate different temperature for different parts of the theory. Um, and uh, again, you have this factor of T cubed uh, overall and uh, some uh, ratios of T over T, uh, TB over T or TF over the T uh, for the different species. And here again, uh, here I uh, also uh, wrote explicitly the, the four factors. So here you have uh, some numerical uh, just factors that you can extract from GS. Now, uh, for the non-relativistic particle, as we said also yesterday, uh, the entropy density is practically zero due to the exponential suppression. And that's why um, we actually consider the entropy mostly uh, or only coming from the radiation uh, degrees of freedom. And the final thing I want also to add to the discussion of yesterday, of course, I didn't, I always said, okay, these GS or G star are constant. Well, they are not uh, really constant. So here is the behavior, for example, the evolution of G star and G star S, which is GS in my, um, in my um, expression before. And you see, as a, as a function of the temperature, you have uh, epochs where they are relatively constant. Uh, so here um, at the beginning, for example, for the standard model, you have uh, they, they take a value of around 100. And in that uh, 100 is counting all particles, including top, Z, W, and practically at high temperature, they are all practically massless and they are all relativistic. Then, of course, uh, as long um, as soon as the temperature reaches the mass of the top, the mass of the Z, the mass of the W, they slowly decouple, and therefore um, they become non relativistic, and uh, therefore this, the number of degrees of freedom starts to decrease. But at the beginning, of course, the decrease, if you just lose one particle species with respect to many others, uh, the change is not very, very, uh, very strong. So this, you see that you are practically in a plateau. Instead, you start to have a very big jump at the QCD phase transition because there really you have a complete change of degrees of freedom. You go from quarks to um, hadrons and mesons, um, and this is exactly what gives you this drop. Uh, luckily, I mean, the, the coupling of the WIMP is usually happening more in this epoch, so at around the lecture week scale. So um, 
a few GV, we will see in a minute. Uh, so in that epoch, as I said, the number of degrees of freedom is uh, um, relatively stable. And then later on, you have again another epoch where you have a relatively stable um, number of degrees of freedom after the QCD phase transition and where you are left with the proton, neutron, uh, pions and electrons, neutrinos. And then at a certain point, uh, you have also the decoupling of the electrons. And the decoupling of the electrons, uh, electrons and positron annihilate um, and actually heat up uh, the photon bath. So uh, this is exactly also what brings about the difference of temperature between neutrinos and photons. And in that, uh, in that um, due to that uh, difference, you have also slight difference you see here between G star S and G star. Because in the expression I had before, of course, in one case, you have the temperature default, uh, the ratios here. So in the, these ratios in practice uh, change, of course, if you have uh, uh, the cubic uh, power of the temperature or the fourth power of the temperature. So uh, in that sense, that is why for a lot uh, of time, you can assume that the G star and G S are the same, but then uh, at the really, really late epochs, you have actually, to, in some sense, you have a slight difference between them. Okay, so I hope this uh, helps a little bit to put things into context. Of course, in this picture, there is only the standard model. So this G star counts only the standard model states and the uh, standard one neutrinos. Uh, if you have, of course, additional particles, then the picture would change and uh, you would have to add um, a different uh, number of degrees. Is a freedom. Uh, for example, in a supersymmetric model, you would more or less at high temperature double the number of degrees of freedom. Um, and uh, depending on the model, you would have different, uh, different values. But of course, here we are at temperatures of, uh, at around uh, 100 GV. We know which kind of particle we have. At least um, we have also laboratory experiments which have uh, um, tried to measure particles. And so uh, we do not um, see anything, any new particle uh, at the LHC or uh, collide other colliders. So that in that sense, we, um, we know uh, that there are some limits on those particles. Of course, one has also to make here a, a comment or a caveat. Um, of course, at colliders, we need a, a sufficiently strong interaction to produce particles. So it's not excluded that we have particles which are uh, around, uh, which are even lighter than this uh, 100 GV scale, uh, if they are sufficiently um, weakly interacting. Okay, so in that sense, uh, this is also the advantage of cosmology that uh, the cosmological background measures in some sense the energy density in any particle, whatever the interaction. So because the gra gravity in some sense uh, has the same strength for every uh, type of particle and that doesn't really care about the strength of interaction uh, for other, uh, other couplings. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the um, expansion of the universe is driven by any type of um, energy density and uh, and therefore in some sense it would also if you would have also a hidden sector with a completely different temperature um, not communicating very much with the standard model that would also contribute and would increase the number of degrees of freedom and uh, that is in some sense one of the ways you can constrain these kind of hidden sectors just from cosmological perspective I guess to, uh, next week on the sterile neutrino lectures, you probably will learn a little bit more about that. Okay, but uh, let me go down to the dark matter production mechanism. Um, and um, as we uh, discussed, uh, one of the prototype is practically the neutrino uh, or a massive neutrino, much uh, heavier than the neutrinos uh, we have in the standard model. I tried to, uh, to derive last yesterday the, the coupling of the neutrinos, the, the standard model neutrinos, and I gave you already this formula, the number density, so the energy density in neutrinos today is uh, proportional to the sum of the neutrino masses. And since we know that the sum of the neutrino masses is pretty small uh, in the uh, standard model, we have limits about a few GeV, electron volts, sorry, a few electron volt from three to beta decay. This means that, of course, uh, this energy density is small and it's smaller than the dark matter one. Uh, so in that sense, we uh, do not really um, have the chance to have a neutrinos as dark matter. Uh, of course, there is also another problem that I guess we'll also maybe discuss next week, that usually if you would even have a neutrino sufficiently heavy, it would still be um, very light and therefore uh, decouple as a relativistic species with a long uh, free streaming length. 
And in that case, a structure formation would actually uh, show up um, and, and take place in a different way of what we, I described uh, in the first lecture. You would have still, in some sense, the possibility to um, compensate from fluct fluctuations where if they are at, at the length scale smaller than the free streaming length by just moving around if you want this uh, dark matter component. And this is also another reason why we have actually even stronger limits uh, from cosmology on the mass of the neutrino than uh, these uh, few electron volts. Uh, you can see, of course, this depends a bit on the uh, models you put in. So if you use lambda CDM or if you extend the model, but generically you find constraints on the masses which are below the electron volt. So this means, again, this is another way in some sense we can learn also about neutrinos from cosmology, uh, but in some sense it just tells us that if there is any um, component, I mean, some part of course is there because we know the neutrino exists, uh, but um, in general, uh, the idea is that this density has to be sufficiently small not to give you uh, too many um, effects and to change too much structure formation. So um, the important picture is uh, this picture here, which I drawed also yesterday. And this is, um, in some sense, um, was in the 70s um, discussed by uh, Zeldovich, Lee, and Weinberg. And uh, as I said, at that time, they realized that um, you have as, as this relativistic uh, decoupling, as we discussed, where the density in principle would then grow with the mass. And then you have the non-relativistic decoupling, where the density is, again, the number density suppressed by the exponential. And therefore, if you, since you, the curve goes down, at a certain point, we will again meet uh, a particular value of the energy density. And here, of course, at the old days, people were interested of having omega h square of order 1. Uh, that was the uh, original idea that uh, practically there was no cosmological constant in the early discussions. So uh, the dark matter uh, was making up uh, practically all the critical uh, energy density. And in that sense, as I said, you, you have always, if you want, a uh, part uh, where you match uh, this energy density uh, from the relativistic side, but usually with a pretty small mass, as you see here. And you have, on the other hand, uh, the other region where you again can match the energy density. And this is usually in a much larger mass. So you have a gap in between. And here you see is a starting from a few GeV. And of course, here uh, one has assumed some, um, some interaction. And indeed, the continuous curve, curve is coming from the weak interaction. And you see that, um, so this one would be corresponding more or less uh, to a heavy neutrino. So that in that case, uh, they uh, derived a kind of lower bound of the uh, heavy neutrino mass to avoid overclosure. So if you have too much energy density in this state, you would have too large uh, energy density in the universe above the critical value. And, um, and this is exactly one thing which is important to notice. Of course, the, what, where exactly this bound is depends on the cross-section you assume. Uh, so you see here that uh, you can change depending if you take weaker or uh, uh, stronger cross-section. Of course, the stronger cross-section is, uh, is another discussion. Uh, so here they, they are assuming then that you have a cross-section which grows with energy. So it's a slightly different um, assumption. But the other important point is that at a certain point, you also have a, a unitarity bound, which I will discuss in a minute um, after the after discussion a bit uh, the, the mechanism. And uh, we will see that. So that in some sense, we have a kind of lower bound on the mass of the uh, WIMP and a kind of upper bound, assuming the strongest uh, annihilation cross section you can have. So that in that sense, it's, it's a very, very well defined, if you want, a window where things work out. Of course, where you are depends on the cross section. So depends on the couplings the dark matter has, and of course, on the mass of the dark matter. Okay, so after seeing so this- Sorry, may I ask yeah. a question? Yes, of course. Um, it's not clear for me why in the relativistic limit, the, um, the abundance grows linearly with the mass. I thought that in the relativistic limit, the density only depends on the temperature. No, the number density only depends on the temperature. But of course, the energy density then depends on the mass, because at the end of the day, the particle has to become non-relativistic to become a ah. really a dark matter candidate. So it, it's the formula. So you can take uh, the formula here for the, uh, for the uh, if you want, number density at the coupling. 
But then today, they, uh, this is the mass times this number density, uh, and then in some cases, they're scaled by a possible. Ah, I see, I see. OK, of course. Mm -hmm. okay? Of course. OK, OK, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> So that's why here it grows. But as I said, at a certain point, you have to go uh, in the number density from this value to this value. And then the exponential kicks in, and then you go down. Mm, OK. OK. Yeah. So uh, this is exactly what happens. But you can also see it in another picture, which I also tried to draw uh, yesterday in the discussion. And um, I didn't have time to uh, really discuss it, perhaps, in detail. But here is the typical um, picture. So I am drawing here, um, and I think also Sarif discussed all this already. So this equation you should be or have already seen it uh, today and discuss it a bit more in detail what the solution is. But the, the main picture is the fact that the equilibrium density of a particle uh, drops when you go in with temperature below the mass of the particle. So here the variable is as usual, uh, this variable which is uh, mass over temperature. And, um, and you see that this, uh, this goes down pretty quickly due to the exponential. On the other hand, um, the real density of the dark matter of any particle actually uh, can follow this curve only as long as the cross section here of annihilation, which changes the particle number, is sufficiently large or it, it is effective enough. As you saw in the discussion uh, with the Sarif, and I will uh, show actually the plot in a minute again, what is really important is this sigma divided by the Hubble parameter. This is actually what tells you where you drop out or, or where you, so this, this condition here. And exactly this point where you, in some sense, uh, go out of equilibrium, and uh, this is also called uh, usually freezing out, uh, it uh, depends what, exactly at what is the cross section. So the the stronger the cross section, the longer you stay in equilibrium, and the smaller is the number density at the end. Now, notice in this curve, of course, I have a plateau at the end, and why? Because I'm using this variable nx divided by the entropy density, or this y variable that also Sarif was using. And this is a very convenient because for this uh, variable, uh, the dilution coming from the expansion of the universe is the same for the number density as the entropy density. So this ratio is constant if you just have no collision term. So if you would have collision term equal to zero, this uh, is, is exactly constant. And indeed, this is what happens after a while when this uh, cross section is no more effective, you have effectively that uh, this value remains constant and this is this plateau. And again, um, you have the two cases, again, the relativistic decoupling that we have just discussed and the non-relativistic, which is suppressed. So where you have, again, depending on the cross section, you have a different level here of number or different number density. And of course, depending then on the cross section, you would also need a different mass for the dark matter in order to match the uh, energy density of the universe, if you want. Now, what has been called a uh, for a long time the WIMP miracle is that actually everything works out very nicely for electroweak, uh, for the electroweak scale, both for the mass and for the cross section. So if you take a mass of dark matter about 100 GV and you take also an electroweak uh, type of cross section, so one over uh, something like uh, 100 GV squared, uh, you remember a cross section is always one over a mass squared, or uh, if you want a, a surface, uh, um, because it's, it's, it's really in some sense in unit, depending on which units you use, we will get to that back in a minute. And if you have those, uh, those two scales, um, you end up with having a, a number density which is more or less uh, one, so in, in uh, critical density. So omega, this omega parameter is approximately of order one. And this is exactly uh, one very, very uh, characteristic or very interesting uh, mass region, also because we know that at that mass scale, also the breaking of the electroweak symmetry happens and many things happens. Therefore, in some sense, uh, we could hope uh, that this uh, is, in some sense, the physics which give us electroweak symmetry breaking, uh, et cetera, could also give us, in some sense, the dark matter. And indeed, there are many, many uh, models where uh, the scales are connected in that way, uh, in particular, for example, supersymmetry, where we have a supersymmetric particle at the electroweak scale to stabilize the Higgs mass. 
And this brings us automatically a candidate. Uh, in this case, it would be the neutralino, which is the super partner of the uh, gauge bosons, of the weak gauge bosons and the photons. And, um, and that was one of the models people studied, but of course it's not the only possibility. Here, any particle which has more or less the correct um, cross-section would give you the correct number density. So in that sense, uh, it's, a very, it's a very generic mechanism. It works in many different models. Now, uh, here I am also giving you uh, just uh, the, um, the expressions. So I see I don't have, I didn't put the, let, let me go to the uh, full screen. Do you see better now? I hope so. Yes, it's good. Yes. Okay, uh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, the only problem with the full screen is that I don't see anything anymore. <laughs> so, okay, but I think it's probably fine. Um, now, uh, you can uh, check here uh, that um, these are the expressions, and the, this is, the first one is a practical expression that uh, I think Sarif already gave you, and it was in the exercise. Is this. This is uh, the expression you obtain by uh, changing the variable, as I said, uh, using uh, this uh, y variable, which is the abundance also called, and it's the number density rescaled by the entropy density. And in that case, you see immediately that uh, you have exactly the sigma v divided by uh, the Hubble parameter. And here is the Hubble parameter is written explicitly. And the sigma v is the averaged, uh, the thermal averaged cross section, which you can uh, see also the expression here below. Um, this expression um, is uh, quite uh, nice because it is, uh, you can write it as a function of the usual cross section you are uh, used to in, in particle physics. So you see it here, this S uh, the, that I am, yes, that's the reason why I didn't do full screen because I lose uh, the possibility to have a pointer. That's a bit inconvenient. Uh, let me go back. Yes, so this sigma is practically the cross section you would get uh, normally. And uh, you see that uh, in some sense you have to average it out. This K1 uh, is a Bessel function which is connected to this exponential e to the minus energy over temperature. And uh, um, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, rescaled with this z variable is in some sense rescaled with temperature so that you can um, take, uh, take it in some sense impartial also out. But uh, this, of course, is an, uh, an expression that you cannot uh, usually compute analytically, but you can compute it numerically very, very easily. And if you want to have an estimate, this is exactly what uh, Sarif discussed, which is in the next slide. This expression and this approximate solution. Um, and uh, here you can plug in, as Sarif has explained you, this expansion in the velocity of the cross section. And in that case, you can get also some analytical or, or if you want, some approximate solution through, um, through these recursive formulas. But of course, uh, this is also one thing I want to mention. Nowadays, uh, the main uh, way to solve and find the, the, the solution, and so the, the energy density today, is of course uh, to solve the equation uh, numerically. And uh, there are also packages on the market, uh, in particular Micromegas. Um, you may know that it's a public uh, code which can uh, solve the Boltzmann equation, gives you the dark matter density uh, for many different models. And actually, you can also extend it to your own model if you want by adding uh, the, the defining the model and then computing uh, the uh, cross sections. So uh, this is connected to COMPEP, which also can compute the, the, the cross sections. So you don't have to do it even by hand. And of course, there are also other historical uh, codes. Uh, one very, also very famous and very useful is also Dark Susie, which was more based on supersymmetry, for example, uh, which uh, is also uh, in that sense, uh, one of the possibility to compute the number densities and includes also uh, different packages with, to compute. For example, we'll see it in a minute also what is uh, the uh, annihilation today or what is, for example, the scattering with, uh, with a detector, which we will get to in a minute. Okay, so um, in this uh, setting here, I want to uh, complete, uh, yes, so I will stop sharing and now and go uh, to the, um, to the uh, tablet. Let me see if I can do that and discuss a couple of things which are, uh, I think, important to, um, and uh, um, I want to derive a few uh, results. 
So one results I would like to, uh, yeah. So first of all, let me give you a couple of interesting uh, relations. So, uh, which I think I didn't give you completely yesterday. So here, let me, ah, it's a red. Let me change the color. Okay, so we have some important relation. So uh, just uh, for convenience and for um, uh, omega, we saw is rho divided by rho c. And uh, rho c is actually connected to the Hubble parameter today. So is 3h squared over 8 pi gn, the Newton constant. And if you plug in numbers, um, uh, remember also that usually we, for h, uh, we uh, write it as uh, as little h, which is a number between um, zero and one. Uh, it's actually uh, near to 0 0.7 or something like that, or 0 0.6. And you, you write it uh, as uh, the units here are 100 uh, kilometer per second per megaparsec. To remember the units, you can remember what the Hubble parameter also gives you. It is, in some sense, the velocity uh, depending on the distance of the object. So here is the velocity, kilometer per second, and the per megaparsec. And this is, comes just from the metric. And the, if you want the line element, if you look at um, objects far, uh, far away, they will look to you as moving uh, faster due to just the expansion of the universe. Now, if you plug in this expression here, you can get uh, the following expression. You get, um, I will write it, for example, in, uh, you can write it in kilograms or in, um, in, uh, in proton masses. So if you write it in proton, I will write it in proton mass because it's uh, better if you want quantity for a particle physicist is something like 11.23 h square and you have a, a proton mass per cubic meter. Okay, so H square, so H is usually uh, between uh, 0 0.667, 0 0.72. So you, we know that uh, there is this uh, slight discrepancy between C and B, well, slight, it's uh, now actually growed in the last time, but um, let's say H is of the order 0 0.7. So if you square it, H square is of order one half. So you see that what happens is the critical uh, critical density uh, for the universe uh, today is approximately six protons for a uh, for cubic uh, meter. So six GV, if you want to translate the proton mass into GV is approximately one GV. So you see that it's a very, very uh, dilute gas if you want. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have very, very few particles uh, per uh, cubic meter. Of course, you know probably that in the usual matter you have an Avogadro number of particles uh, per, per, per liter and things like that. So it's a complete different scale. Now, of course, this is not the, uh, the density we have today also, for example, around the Earth. Uh, this is larger because we have uh, the collapse, the gravitational collapse. So the density, of course, in, within the galaxies and the clusters is larger than the average uh, or the critical density. So in that sense, this is in the, the density if you average out over all the universe and uh, therefore uh, locally you have a slightly larger value than this. Uh, now, uh, given that, um, of course, I want to what I want to compute. Uh, this is, is what I need later. Uh, what I want to go through very quickly is actually this uh, unitarity bound. So let me go to that. So how large the mass of such a wind particle can be? And in part, you have done it or already in some sense in the exercise, but just let me draw it here very quickly. So the unitarity bound is connected to having uh, the cross section of the dark matter to be in some sense, the larger uh, cross section possible. And uh, we have uh, usually in this um, partial wave expansion that the cross section for the non-elastic processes is uh, practically uh, four pi, 
2j plus 1 for a particular wave. So here I have also dependence on j. Sorry, I should have a j not a 5. Yes, and then you have uh, the spin of the particle squared, and you have uh, a one minus the uh, elastic scatterings of the same um, angular momentum divided the momentum square. And this is the momentum of the initial particles if you are in the center of mass frame. Now, uh, this means that you can take uh, as a maximal cross section, so and uh, here I take also the j equal to zero uh, case, uh, just uh, as an example, um, you can get uh, something like uh, four pi. And I, I think here spin equal to zero, just for, for an example, of course you can change this, is four pi over the momentum squared or less than equal. And this, you can again, the momentum square, you can uh, rephrase uh, in velocity. So it's a uh, four pi over m square of the dark matter times the velocity squared. So that at the end, you have sigma v of the order of uh, four pi over m square x v, okay? And this one you you can plug in in the uh, in the uh, expansion we had uh, you had also by with Sarif uh, so you have for example that v square uh, again is of the order of the uh, temperature over the mass of the particle so here instead of having uh, v square you have v but nevertheless you get um, you get here um, the, the the correct value so you get uh, sigma v average in temperature is something like um, four pi. So this one was the X uh, variable over M square dark matter. Sorry, here is not X is dark matter, of course. And uh, one over V is X to the minus one half. Okay, and uh, in principle, if you really do the average, you have also a factor of order one here. Um, I think I took it, it's a square root of six or something, but uh, it's not so very important. And of course, what you can do now is to, um, to use this and plug it in in the formula before we had before. And uh, if you do that, uh, you find uh, the following uh, result. You can get the omega dark matter H square. Ah, yes, oh, sorry, I forgot completely. Uh, yes, the last point here. Uh, yeah, you see that the rho C depends on H square. So in some sense, we have this dependence on the H square. That's uh, in order to get rid uh, of this dependence, uh, often is actually useful uh, to de describe uh, omega, not omega, but omega h square. So omega h square is equal to rho h square divided by rho c. And then you see that this one is exactly uh, canceling out this uh, h square dependence here. So that one is a quantity which is really a, a density uh, or a ratio of densities without any dependence on the Hubble parameter. And uh, this is something that the, the most useful uh, quantity to use. So uh, here is again exactly rho divided by this number. Okay. And in that sense, it means that you're really computing uh, densities as a function to a re re reference density without any dependence on the Hubble. So even if you would turn out that the Hubble is changed, uh, this in some sense does not affect uh, this particular density. Okay, so that's why you find very often H, omega H square as a uh, measure of the density or as a parameter that people compute instead of omega because here you get rid of the H square dependence. Of course, I mean, H square nowadays is pretty well measured, 
but historically also in the old days um, there were always some uncertainties and also today uh, as we uh, already saw uh, in the plots there is some discrepancy between measurement in the early universe and the late universe so it's better to get rid of it Good, so if you want that, you get exactly the uh, mass of the dark matter, the y of the dark matter, divided at the uh, critical density times the entropy now. And this takes exactly into account the fact that you, if you have dilutions or things like that. And uh, if you want to, uh, yeah, you can uh, plug in the numbers and you get uh, something like the pi over three square root of G star over 10. The ratio of the GS now to the GS at the time of the coupling. And then you have a mass of the dark matter squared uh, um, yeah, so you have a dependence on the temperature of the photons uh, with cause of the entropy here. I count here mostly the, the entropy into the photons. And I have here some other uh, parameter, rho c, here the Planck scale, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's practically it. And xf, sorry, xf to power one half. And if you, uh, if you use this expression, uh, you have therefore that in some sense, uh, in order uh, to have omega a, a h squared to order 0 0.1, which is what is the dark matter density today, we have a limit on the mass. And uh, this gives you in some sense a limit on mass of the dark matter, less or equal to something like uh, two, 2.9, 10 to the 12, uh, sorry, uh, 10 to the 6 here. I, I, was, I had the expression for the mass squared, but of course I am going directly to the mass. So let me correct this. It's something like 1.7, 10 to the 6, you have these x, f, to the um, minus one half. And you have in principle the omega h square divided one actually here. So, well, one, I don't need to divide it. To the one half. And if you plug in number, what you find is that this number is of the order. Uh, of course, here depends a little bit what you put uh, for XF, uh, but it is uh, something small, but not too small. So it's something like uh, order um, 0 0.4 or something like that. And uh, this one is again, it's a square root of 0 0.1. So it's also a smallish number. So here you have a, a limit of the order of um, something like uh, 500 TV or so. Or actually, it's actually a little bit small if I remember correctly. Yeah, so I think it's 50 TV, sorry. I have the numbers without uh, putting in the XF and this, uh, but uh, this in some sense reduces here this, uh, this number a bit uh, and um, Yes, yeah, so here, here, of course, the units are GV. I forgot to go write it. Okay. So this is exactly what I was trying to say before. Uh, in some sense, you would, uh, this is the strongest cross-section you could think of. And this is in some sense, the unitarity limit. Um, and this means that this is the, the, the upper bound on the mass of the dark matter. And if you want, um, this is exactly what gives you a very, very clear picture of where to look for dark matter, because you have a, a lower bound, as I said, uh, coming uh, more connected to, to the, of course, this depends on the cross section. Again, the lower bound, if you take a weak cross section, if you take a, something uh, different, you could go to lighter masses. Uh, but you have uh, then a kind of upper bound. So uh, you have a range of masses where uh, the mechanism could give you the right dark matter. 
And in some sense, you have a hope also to cover all this range of masses and be able to uh, find the dark matter or exclude the dark matter. And this is exactly what we will discuss um, in a minute. Uh, before going to the discussion how to see the dark matter or how to try to find out, I have uh, one other piece of uh, thing I want to discuss. Now, uh, the equations I gave you before, it's very simple, is the case of uh, um, uh, WIMP dark matter, uh, which is the only particle which goes out of equilibrium and the rest is all equilibrium particles. But of course, you can have more complicated pictures. So, um, more complex cases. And nowadays in the literature, you find a lot of discussion, many different cases. You find something uh, um, co-annihilation, which I will discuss here, semi-annihilation, or um, other cases where you have these, um, if you want, scattering driven, um, and etc., uh, which are different cases and uh, they go in different directions. Um, the, the case I want just very shortly to discuss here is the co-annihilation. And the co-annihilation case is the case where you don't have just one dark matter particle decoupling, but you have another particle which is slightly heavier than the dark matter, which is also decoupling more or less at the same time. So then you have to keep track of two particles in the uh, thermal bath. And in principle, you would have two equations. So if you want, you would have a, a Boltzmann equation. I write it here for each species. I just catch uh, the, the expressions. So you would have uh, the uh, usual collision integral where this is, uh, for example, you could have processes in this case where uh, here you have, sorry, an I of course, which I forgot. Yes, so you have an I. And here you can have also processes where you have a particle of type. So the dark matter, for example, um, annihilating with some other particles. So the, the, let me call it the J particle going to standard model, standard model. Okay, so these processes are not there if you consider only the pure dark matter, but this is also a process which changes the number of dark matter and you have to put it here. So for example, you have this X sigma uh, IJ, V IJ, uh, I in this case is the dark matter. And here you sum over J. And then you have, as usual, Ni and J minus Ni equilibrium and J equilibrium. So this is one uh, contribution. Of course, you have the usual contribution with the uh, with the standard model. So you could have, um, yeah. So I write again the, the usual. Um, yeah, here I, J can also be I. So here included is also the dark matter dark matter interaction, but you could also have dark matter and something else interaction. And then of course you could have also different type of processes. In particular, you can have processes which exchange uh, the dark matter into the J particle. So this one would be processes, for example, of this type, uh, which is called uh, X prime IJ, VIJ, where you have one I particle in the beginning, but you have a standard model particle um, in, the, in the other, and then you have an um, yeah, so okay, here you can write it an equilibrium minus uh, an equilibrium again. And you have also in principle also uh, decays or, or other uh, type of processes, uh, which I don't write here. So uh, it's, uh, so for example, the decays. So, so okay, let me write it explicitly, perhaps it's easier. Yeah, because of course, the heavier particle, the J particle, which is heavier, could decay into the dark matter through some interaction. So let me write it here just very basically um, decays or inverse decays. And uh, you have, in some sense, two, two Boltzmann equations for the dark matter and for the J particle. 
And now, of course, what happens is that many of these processes, especially the one who transfers numbers from the dark matter to the J particle, so this process here would be a process of this type, where you have, uh, for example, dark matter becoming a J particle, and here you have standard model, standard model. Then, of course, this changes the number of dark matter particle and the, man, ma, the, the number of J particles, but doesn't change the total number of dark matter plus J particles. Indeed, if you then try, you can write a very much simpler equation if you uh, write an equation for the sum of the dark matter plus the J uh, number. And in that case, this process here actually uh, doesn't contribute. And also the decay do not contribute because the decay, again, uh, the uh, assumed assumption is the J particle decays into the dark matter one to one. So you the decay one J particle will give you one dark matter particle. So at the end, uh, you can uh, write the for the total number which is the number of dark matter plus the number of J particles. And then you have a much simpler equation, which is actually more or less the same as the equation we already know. Because here you have a kind of effective cross section times the N square. Well, here I have the minus sign minus N square equilibrium. And here this effective cross section is just nothing else as the uh, sum of all the processes. We just change the number of I or J, so dark matter or J partic uh, particle number. And here there is the generic equilibrium density. OK. So this is, of course, a very convenient way because you can use the same equation as before to solve also for this case, just redefining uh, the cross-section with a total cross-section. And in this cross-section, there are all uh, type of processes like this, OK? But note that one assumption that you are doing is that these processes, the processes which exchange the number density of dark matter into J number, are actually in equilibrium. And this is usually what happens often because these processes, as you see here, are proportional to only to one power of the uh, of these uh, decoupling uh, number density, and the other number density is the standard model number density. And the standard model number density, of course, is very large because they, they, those particles are in equilibrium. So in that sense, here you have a weaker uh, dependence, or it's only a dependent linear in the number and not quadratic like you have here. So the Boltzmann suppression in these processes is weaker than the Boltzmann suppression you have in the annihilation. So the, in many, many cases, these processes continue to be active even later than, uh, than the decoupling in some sense. And you can therefore assume that those are in equilibrium and you don't care, and uh, just uh, take this effective uh, cross-section uh, as the, the, the relevant one for the decoupling. Note that this is not always the case. Indeed, in, in some cases, this is called also co conversion-driven freeze-out, where you could also have this process going out of equilibrium first in some cases. It depends, of course, on which type of process you have. And then in that sense, that would really set the, the temperature of which you are going out of equilibrium. And in principle, um, yeah, as I said, there are many cases you could explore. Um, another additional case I want just to, uh, to mention is this the case where you go out of kinetic equilibrium before you go out of chemical equilibrium. If you remember yesterday, I, I discussed these two things. This is also connected to similar processes. This similar process also dark matter, dark matter would keep the dark matter in kinetic equilibrium. And uh, that also can change your results. And uh, of course, uh, there have been also their studies. And nowadays, uh, you can, of course, also numerically solve the Boltzmann equation for more than one species and try to see all these effects. Um, so as I said, if you look in the literature, I don't have the, really the time to go through all possibilities. There is this co-annihilation case, which is really, uh, in some sense, uh, the case where you can actually use the same equation just with a uh, different um, effective uh, scattering cross-section. 
But there are also some other cases where you have really to look at the two coupled uh, Boltzmann equations. And as I said, in many cases, it is possible. Uh, so you can solve it numerically and you can find uh, many different, um, if you want, effects and also different part of the parameter space becomes interesting or not. Uh, note that here, of course, you have, uh, sorry, uh, just a uh, final uh, point on the co-annihilation. Here, of course, you have the number density of the particle J and uh, the number density of the particle I. And in this number density equilibrium, once as we saw, this enters the mass, of course, of the two particles. So in that sense, if J is much heavier than I, then here you have a strong Longer exponential suppression. So uh, this co-annihilation is really um, effective only if the mass difference between this J particle and the dark matter particle is relatively small compared to the temperature. And as you, you have seen, uh, the, um, the decoupling is usually at around this XF of order uh, 20, 30. Uh, this means uh, that the uh, temperature is usually one third or one twentieth of the mass. And this is also the order of magnitude of the uh, mass splitting you can really accommodate in this case to have uh, co-annihilation being uh, relevant and being active. Okay, so this means, for example, if you have a hundred GV particle, you are talking about uh, mass splitting of the order five or 10 GV. Of course, nowadays uh, the masses, uh, for example, for supersymmetry have become a bit heavier. So uh, you can live with also larger mass splittings. But still, you need, uh, you need the two particles to be uh, not far away from each other uh, in mass. OK, so that's just a little bit uh, extension. So nowadays, as I said, um, there is a possibility to explore many of these things uh, numerically. So we have, uh, yeah, there is uh, actually a plethora of different uh, cases and different um, possibilities discussed in the, uh, in the literature. And usually the mass, of course, of the dark matter can be in the, uh, in the same ballpark. But of course, depending exactly if you have co-annihilation or not co-annihilation, you can change uh, the parameters and the mass of the dark matter that you need to have uh, the right dark matter density. OK. Maybe the, uh, the moment for, for a short break, Laura? Yes, it would be a good uh, moment for questions or a short yes, break. Yes, and qu question, of course. Other questions? Uh, may I ask something? Yes. Um, in this uh, scenario of co-annihilation, this J particle uh, would contribute to the dark matter or it could be a standard model particle? No, no, it would. It, it cannot be a standard model particle. It has, let me come to the, uh, to the phenomenon of WIMP and exactly also how to detect the WIMP. And uh, this is another big advantage of this type of candidates. And uh, this is connected to this uh, diagram, which you probably also have seen a lot of times. I usually it's also drawn only one in some cases. I tend to draw it differently because in some sense it gives you more an idea there are different processes involved. So we are saw that um, we have this annihilation in the early universe, um, which actually uh, really determines the density of the dark matter. And if you plug in number and you translate it in pico barns, you find that the cross section you need is approximately one pico barn to get uh, the right uh, density today. So if you remember here in this expression, if you go in the limit where this one is not important, uh, this is really one over uh, this cross section uh, in, in particular units. So you can uh, put in numbers and find out that that has to be uh, around one pico barn. Uh, but the important point is that this cross section could also bring you to uh, detection today. And in particular, this annihilation that was uh, happening in the early universe could also happen today. The only point is that, of course, you need a sufficiently large density of dark matter. But hopefully, uh, we do have, uh, luckily, we do have uh, uh, such large density exactly because we had the, the gravitational collapse. So within uh, galaxies and within clusters, the density of the dark matter, as I told you before, is actually larger than the uh, critical density. And there, you could hope to still have uh, the possibility to see this indirect detection. And this means, for example, annihilation of the dark matter in any possible dark uh, standard model particle. And uh, this, of course, depending on the standard model particle, you can get different signals. We will discuss it in a minute. Uh, but this, in some sense, is uh, directly related 
to this early universe annihilation. Um, of course, um, usually in quantum field theory, if you have a process like this annihilation, you also expect to have the process of uh, scattering. And uh, usually the same coupling will give you automatically not only annihilation, but also the elastic scattering. And in some sense, we need it also some elastic scattering in the early universe to keep the dark matter in kinetic equilibrium. And uh, again, uh, therefore, you can try to look at the scattering of the dark matter against the normal matter. And this is the direct detection, which we'll discuss later. And finally, you have also, you can also go opposite. Instead of annihilation, you can have the opposite of the annihilation, which is the production of dark matter. And this you could hope to realize in a collider. And you have a standard model initial uh, state, which gives you two dark matter states. For example, usually two, because you have this symmetry, which uh, if you want to have a really uh, stable dark matter, then usually you have uh, something like a Z2 symmetry or a parity, and therefore you produce two dark matter particles. Uh, of course, if you just produce the dark matter, you would actually see nothing in your detector because dark matter is stable and just escapes uh, like a neutrino. Uh, so what you usually need is an additional standard model particle. Here I just draw a photon, but in principle it can be anything else, uh, also a gluon or some other uh, Z boson W or whatever. Uh, so that you have, in some sense, a recoil and you have a, a missing, uh, missing PT in the, in the detector. So you see one uh, standard model particle coming in one direction and nothing in the other direction. And this would tell you that there is something which is going out due to conservation of uh, momentum. And in some sense, uh, the goal, or at least the dream also, <laughs> was in the, already in some years, to see the dark matter in all these three channels and put everything together to be really able to, in some sense, disentangle what type of model do we have for dark matter. So now in the last part of the lecture, I want to go through these three, uh, three type of uh, signatures and just to give you a flavor uh, what it is. I will start with indirect detection, which has actually quite a some overlap also on the lectures on multi-messenger uh, astronomy, because of course, also in this case, you have annihilation of dark matter. Uh, you do not know exactly in which particle you would annihilate, and you could have uh, indeed a multi-messenger signal. So a signal not only in one uh, channel, for example, photons, but you could have also a signal in neutrinos, uh, a signal in cosmic rays, and this is exactly what uh, uh, people are exploring. So let me start with this indirect detection. And this indirect detection, uh, the simplest, if you want, uh, to uh, explore is actually the signal in particles which can propagate relatively um, straight in the universe. And these are, for example, photons and neutrinos. And for the photon flux, you can try uh, very simply to compute what is the flux that you would obtain uh, today in, uh, on the Earth. And uh, this flux, of course, would be proportional to the cross-section of annihilation uh, with the particular uh, branching fraction in the particle. Of course, I mean, you could produce gammas or, uh, from, uh, from, from three level, if you want, directly from the process. But usually, dark matter has a very, very weak interaction to photons. So usually what you do is to produce some other particle of the standard model. For example, you could produce a W or you produce a bottom quark or a tau or something like that. And then this particle in some sense would as a secondary produce a photon. So this dn in dE is exactly taking care of that part of physics. Um, but generically, many, many channels will produce a, a final state uh, uh, flux in photons uh, so that you hope uh, to be able to see. And I will show you the spectrum in a minute. So this part in some sense is connected to the particle model. So how exactly your dark matter annihilates. But then you have another part which tells you how many particles you expect to see, which is connected to the uh, dark matter density and, uh, um, and also the distribution of the dark matter in the halo. So this is usually the integral along the line of sight of the density squared of the dark matter. It is a density squared, of course, because it is uh, annihilation. So you need two dark matter particles to come together. And uh, here, of course, I'm using the density uh, squared. So I divide by the mass of the dark matter squared because um, this gives me exactly the numbers squared. 
Now, uh, I have to integrate to a part in uh, along the long the light of sight, the, the line of sight, because in this case, the propagation of the light is, is straight. So, and uh, depending on where I look at, I could have a different um, density, of course. In particular, for example, if I look at the center of the galaxy, I would expect a larger flux than if I look uh, on the anti center. Uh, just because the density of dark matter is uh, larger in the center of the galaxy. And of course, depending on how large this density is at the center of the galaxy, I have different results for this uh, integral. This integral is often called J factor, and it depends again uh, on the directionality in the sky. So for example, here I exemplified J of theta, theta is the, the angle. And it can change a lot. I will show it in a minute how strong it can change. So in some sense, therefore, you could choose to look in the sky in the directions where you expect to have the largest flux. On the other hand, there is also uh, there are also argument of uh, signal to background um, ratio. So in some cases, uh, looking at the center of the galaxy is not always the best choice because in the center of the galaxy, of course, there is there are many other things than dark matter, in particular also black hole and, and the stars, etc. So it's not always clear that the best place to look is really the center. Now, um, so this is a thing which I discuss in a minute. Um, of course, uh, the, the issue here is of, if you see a flux of particles coming from any direction of the sky, um, the issue is also to be sure those come from dark matter and not from some astrophysical source. And in that sense, uh, one of the hopes is to have a particular feature in this spectrum. So in this part here in the particle physics. So one famous thing is the line. So the fact that you could have an annihilation of uh, dark matter, dark matter into two gammas. Or uh, if it is, uh, yeah, so these two gammas, of course, will be uh, with the energy exactly equal to the mass of the dark matter, because dark matter is no relativistic when it annihilates. So the energy is practically the mass. So this channel would have two advantages. First of all, it would be a line. So it's something which is very difficult to to, to produce astrophysically because you don't have any reasons to have a line at a particular energy. And secondly, uh, it would give you immediately information about the mass of the dark matter. The problem is that, of course, uh, we saw that dark matter usually does not couple to photons. So you would tell me, why can you have this gamma gamma annihilation if the dark matter doesn't couple to photons? Well, I mean, it doesn't couple a tree level, but in most models, if you then have a, a loop diagram, you can couple uh, the dark matter to photons, in particular in supersymmetry, but also in many other models. So at some level, you would get this annihilation into photons, and the hope would, have, would be to really be able to see it. OK? So uh, this is a bit the argument or the discussion for the case of particles which propagate straight. And uh, in that sense, here is the picture from Fermi of the uh, galactic plane. So you see here exactly the galaxy. So as I said, uh, you would uh, think, OK, let's look in the center. But in the center, as I said, it's a very active region. So may, very often, people look around the center, but not exactly in the center. But you can uh, try to develop the strategy which gives you the best signal to uh, background ratio. Just as a comment before going on about annihilation, uh, of course, um, similar things you could do for for decaying dark matter. And uh, we are not really 100% sure that dark matter has to be stable. We don't even know if the proton is stable in the standard model. And in principle, you could think also that uh, for the dark matter, you could have very, very long lifetime and you could have a small uh, decay rate that becomes active uh, today. In that case, you can have again a flux of particles. The expression is very similar. Here you have the decay instead of the annihilation. And of course, the proportionality here is to the density instead of the density squared. So the J factor is for the decay is uh, weaker than the J factor for the annihilation. And here I am uh, drawing the two J factor as a function of the angle with respect to the center of the galaxy. In this case, I was uh, taking a Navarro Franklin white profile, I think. So it's, it's singular, if you want, at the center. Uh, but you see here that for the annihilating dark matter, the J factor can grow by uh, three, four orders of magnitude, so from the outskirt to the center. In the case of decaying, since you have only one factor of rho, uh, the growth is, is much weaker. And in particular, if you have just a one over R square type of uh, dependence, or, or if you have even a core, uh, this integral is actually also finite even at the center. 
So uh, that's, that is why, in this case, is a Navarro Franco White, which has a, a bit stronger um, dependence. So you have a, a still an, a, an increase in the middle, but uh, it is much weaker. So it's a factor of 10 or so uh, increase with respect to the outskirt to the center. So in that sense, um, the strategy where to look for dark matter could change depending if it is annihilating or decaying, but otherwise the, the spectral properties could be actually the same. And let me go to the spectral property. Um, here, I, for example, it's an old computation by Regis and Ulio of the spectra you expect in uh, gamma rays starting from different channels. So here, for example, you could have annihilation in BB bar or WW or tau, tau, plus tau, tau minus. And you see uh, that you get here a similar spectra of uh, photons, because I said the photons are secondary. Um, they come from the fragmentation of these particles. And at the end, uh, for BB bar and WW, you see that there is a slight difference, but it's not a huge, you always have a kind of bump, which goes down at the energy more or less equal to the mass of the dark matter. For the case where you have annihilation into leptons, uh, the spectrum is a bit harder. And this is because these particles are lighter. And uh, so you have here a slight different uh, behavior. You could have uh, more energetic uh, photons. But nevertheless, you see also that um, in this case, there is no gamma. So there is no gamma line. This is practically the spectrum you obtain uh, from the uh, annihilation into other channels. Uh, just to mention, of course, you would also have uh, a spectrum in electrons, and uh, this spectrum of electrons then could give you also other uh, signals. Uh, for example, you could have uh, additional um, rescattering of the electrons, producing also gamma. And here, for example, uh, are uh, the spectra you would expect, and those, of course, are shifted to lower energies, but they could also be there. Um, and, and in some sense, this is again in this um, multi-messenger setting, you would uh, look in practice in signals in different, also in, for the photons, uh, different energies of the photons. Okay, uh, but of course, the most important or the perhaps the most characteristic things are uh, features which are uh, spectral features. So particular uh, things that you can really fish out from the background. And uh, these are, as I said, the, the, the gamma lines. So here, for example, here is the gamma line. Of course, how strong the gamma lines comes out from the background depends, of course, on the resolution of your detector. Uh, you have always to have a convolution with this, and uh, therefore the gamma lines in some cases can become uh, a bump, even if uh, the, the, how wide the bump is depends on your resolution. But you don't have only the gamma line. You could also have uh, this um, inverse branch drawing here that gives you also a spectrum peaked towards the threshold, so towards the dark matter mass. And in that case, this is this kind of triangular shape. Or you can have a kind of box-like features, which are connected uh, to the fact if you have a dark matter particle uh, decaying to another particle, which, is, uh, which mass difference is not very large. And uh, this can also, in some sense, give you a spectra which is more uh, constrained in one particular energy range instead of the spectra I showed before, which are very, very uh, wide bump, bumps, which in some sense are much more similar to what you also obtain from other astrophysic from astrophysical processes. Okay. So in that sense, that would be the hope to be able to see this, this type of signal and extract them from, from the spectrum of the photons, for example, so that uh, you would be able to extract information. And in particular, you could extract information about the mass of the dark matter from the energy, uh, this threshold energy in some sense, but also from the shape of the spectrum. You could also get information about the different branching fractions, in particular, this gamma-gamma branching fraction compared to other uh, channels. Now, uh, since quite some time, there has been um, a discussion about uh, the center of the galaxy. And uh, it's actually from the um, 10 years or so that uh, there is a discussion of this uh, excess in the galactic center. So you can see it here. It's uh, around the energy of 1, 2 GeV. And um, it's, as I said, again, here, the center really of the galaxy has been blanked out because it's uh, too uh, um, uncertain. But uh, even around the galaxy, you see these, uh, these uh, light areas, which gives you exactly this is this excess. And if you look at it, it could be explained by a dark matter annihilating into BB bar or tau plus tau minus. 
And the, the energy uh, or the mass of this dark matter particle has to be of the order of 40 GeV or so. I mean, as I said, the energy is not very uh, high of this bump is at around few GeVs. And, uh, and this in some sense has occupied people uh, these uh, last years a lot. And there have been also, of course, um, discussions that maybe that is some as other astrophysical background that we didn't consider. Uh, like um, coming uh, from uh, pulsars or, or other or non-resolved sources uh, in the center of the galaxies. Of course, the center of the galaxies, as I said, it's a very, very crowded uh, region. So you cannot really know for sure if this is a signal coming from dark matter. One has to say, though, that uh, they did try to do an analysis of the shape. And the shape does look like something like the distribution you would expect from a dark matter uh, density. So in that sense, this, if you want the dependence and the, the, the fact that it's something like a spherical symmetric um, distribution. Uh, but of course, we have also other limits. So there is not only the galactic center. Um, indeed, uh, another place uh, uh, people spend quite a lot of time looking at in the last years are the dwarf satellite galaxies. The dwarf satellite galaxies have the advantage that they are smaller galaxies, which should be really completely dominated by dark matter. And they are also not so far from us, uh, so that the flux of uh, photons coming from them uh, is not so much suppressed by the distance. Of course, I mean, if you have the, the further away is the object, uh, in the case uh, you have again one over R square suppression of the flux, so you don't want to look too far away. And here is the one of the limits of the Fermi collaboration on uh, coming from combining different dwarf satellite galaxies. In this case, also considering some with the kind of measured J factor. So from uh, dynamical measurement of the dwarf galaxies, it is able to make an estimate of the mass of the object and also what exactly is the J factor, not just assuming some J factors, but really in some sense uh, having a measurement. And uh, you see the limit is actually this uh, black curve here, uh, which actually seems to be, and the red curve was the previous limit uh, using mostly other, other objects and um, not measured J factors, but uh, if you want simulated J factors. And you see that the limits here have become stronger for large mass of the dark matter and weaker for the lightest dark matter. And these regions here, these points, are actually the point corresponding to this uh, excess in the, um, in the galactic center. So in that sense, here they seem to be partially not compatible, if you want. OK, some models were excluded, but not all of them. And very recently, there have been a no new analysis um, uh, by the Maurer and Winkler. You can find it in this reference, which is really coming, came out this year, where they tried again to compare it with this. Um, this is the green area, is the area which explains this galactic excess, uh, also taking into account um, the possible uh, error coming from the density of the dark matter or the, the profile. And you see that the limits now becoming stronger, but still, I mean, if you want, there is still some space. And uh, this is uh, still an unclear issue if uh, we are seeing something in the dark matter in the center or not. It would be nice also there to have in case a confirmation of the signal both in the, from the galactic center and from the dwarf galaxies, of course. Now, um, of course, this was connected to photons, which uh, travel straight. Uh, we have also the possibility, of course, of producing other particles, uh, in particular, any, uh, any um, standard model particles, so protons, antiprotons, electron, or uh, positrons. Uh, the point in that case is that um, the uh, distance, of course, of this particle travel is uh, different, and also they don't travel on a straight line, as you have already probably discussed in the multi messenger lectures. So uh, if you look actually the range of these particles, um, they, it's also energy dependent how far they can go. So in that sense, uh, we have different uh, possibility to explore uh, the galaxy with the, this, these different um, types of particles. And in particular for the electrons, the range is actually very narrow. So we don't really, we are not able to really explore the center of the galaxies. For the antiprotons, only if you would be really uh, at, at energies above 500 GeV or so. So in that sense, it's, uh, um, it's, um, it's a little bit different. And uh, you have, in some sense, a sensitivity to different parts of the profile of the galaxies. 
And moreover, you have the propagation to take into account. So uh, there, of course, uh, you probably also uh, familiar, there is that been a discussion of these uh, anti-proton flux in AMS. And uh, there is still this discussion if there is an excess or no excess, it's probably compatible uh, with if you extend all the possible propagation. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I think probably maybe you will get some discussion uh, about this in the multi-messenger uh, lecture. Uh, the propagation, of course, has a strong influence on exactly how uh, strong the signal, a signal you would expect uh, on the Earth. And uh, the only thing, of course, we look at antiprotons and anti, um, antiparticles in this case, mostly uh, due to the fact that, of course, those rates are uh, much uh, smaller than the rates in protons and electrons, so, so that uh, this is a little bit easier to disentangle uh, the signal from the background. As a final thing in this uh, setting, I want to just discuss the issue that, of course, the annihilation is also active earlier in time. So in particular, also during the, um, the epoch where the cosmic microwave background decouples from the plasma. And actually what happens is that if you have a particle annihilating at that epoch, this could actually warm up the plasma and change this uh, recombination epoch. And, um, and this has also been explored and uh, gives a, a constraint on this annihilation of the dark matter, especially if the annihilation goes into electrons and uh, particles uh, which are uh, light enough to be still active in the plasma at that time and uh, they are electromagnetically uh, charged particles so they can uh, transfer the energy very efficiently to the plasma. And here you see, for example, uh, the limits from the latest uh, Planck paper uh, you, uh, you have, in this case, limits which are a bit weaker, of course, um, and indeed they do not exclude, for example, this uh, galactic center excess or even the antiproton excess. Um, and well, the, 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 as I said, it, here the assumption, uh, of course, is in these, these excesses are probably not uh, coming from annihilation into electron and positron, so this, the, in some sense the limits here uh, from the CMB are not as strong as they could be. But they are still very strong for um, very light dark matter. So you see here, here is the kind of thermal cross section. Yes? Was there a question? No. Okay, so here you see the thermal cross section. So for low masses, we are going below the thermal cross section. And this I forgot to mention also in the previous plot, uh, even here. Here, this curve, uh, yeah, let me go back. Here, this curve it was also the thermal cross section. So assuming the cross section today is the same as the cross sectional annihilation in the, uh, in the early universe, you also here exclude practically masses of the order of 100 GV. So in that sense, uh, we are uh, now really uh, able to constrain the, the, the range of masses we were expecting to have for the WIMP. Okay, so any questions about this? No. Okay, so now let me go to the other uh, important point, uh, which is the uh, direct detection. So the scattering uh, of the dark matter against the, the standard matter. This again, um, it's uh, actually happening um, in, it could happen in the galaxy. We have uh, usually uh, a scattering cross section against uh, a detector, which we model as uh, usually uh, normal matter. And um, the important parameter in this game is actually how much energy you can gain or you can deposit on your detector. And this is actually a relatively simple computation. You can see that the uh, maximal energy transfer is given by this expression, where this here is the reduced mass of the dark matter in the nucleus. And uh, uh, the quantity here is the kinetic energy of the dark matter. So if, of course, the, the, the most favorable case is if you transfer all your kinetic energy of your dark matter to the detector. But you cannot transfer all of it. The only way you can transfer all of it is when the masses of the two particles are exactly the same. So uh, this is, uh, we'll come back in a minute again. And the kinetic energy, unfortunately, of the dark matter in the galaxy is not so large. So here is the expression. So we know the velocity uh, of the dark matter because uh, this is given again by the uh, gravitational potential. So in that sense, is a similar velocity as those of the sun within the galaxy. So it is of the order of 220, 270 kilometers per second. 
And uh, then depending on the mass of the dark matter, you have a different kinetic energies. And you see here for 100 GeV, you have just a 50 keV kinetic energy. So this is quite a low energy. And this means you need really detectors which are very, very sensitive to low energy in order to detect this energy. And if you wanted to see the rate, the rate again of the recoil events um, is given by this expression where you have again the cross section of uh, scattering. You have here a um, uh, form factor for the nucleus uh, because of course you don't have single uh, nucleons or not even single quarks in the target. You have a, uh, a, yeah, you have a, a nucleus and therefore you, you have a, here uh, to take into account uh, that, um, that effect. And the last part is again connected to the halo. And in this case, um, it's not only, not only important the density of the dark matter here on the Earth, but it's also important what is the velocity distribution. Because of course here, as I said, the kinetic energy depends on the velocity distribution. And um, the higher the velocity, the more uh, energy you can transfer. So here you have to integrate uh, to over all velocities which are larger than the threshold velocities. This is the minimal velocity giving you the, the energy equal to your threshold at the detector. And you see here that if you uh, integrate all, you in principle capture also the, you could get information about the distribution of velocity. And the distribution which is usually used uh, as a reference is of course the Maxwell-Boltzmann. Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be exactly that. So uh, this is again another issue if you would be able to extract also some information on the distribution of velocity once one has a detection. Uh, there is another effect which I just mentioned very briefly and this is the fact that you don't have only uh, the velocity of the dark matter. In some sense the, the earth is also moving around the sun and in particular uh, changes the direction of its velocity with respect to the sun uh, in the winter and summer. And in that sense, you have in some cases that you have to add the velocity of the earth to the sun or subtract. And uh, uh, this in some sense increases or decreases the velocity of the dark matter uh, compared to the earth. So that uh, gives you exactly the possibility of shifting in some sense, uh, this integral uh, with uh, to a larger or lower velocity. And in this sense, uh, you would, uh, if you have in some sense, increased the velocity of the dark matter, you would expect to have uh, more events. So you are um, getting a larger rate. And when you decrease the velocity, you have a, a smaller rate. And this is exactly the effect, which is called the annual modulation. So you would have to see that the in your uh, detector, the number of events would depend on the time of the year. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, could you please explain the, the meaning of the V as the denominator of that formula? Yeah. Yes. It's the velocity. The velocity. Yeah. V yeah. over V. I mean, why there, there is a V in the denominator? Uh, let me think. I think it comes from the flux. So you have uh, to consider the flux of dark matter. So you, so you have a one over v due to the fact uh, you you are counting what is the flux of dark matter particle which are hitting your detector. And the flux, of course, it would depend also on uh, on one over v. Okay. Yeah, but maybe uh, we can discuss it longer uh, tomorrow in the discussion if you want. Okay, okay. Because I see that I don't have so much time and um, yeah, so I can try to derive this formula if you want, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the important thing and the important message is what scales do we expect for that channel, for the channel of direct detection. So here again, I have the thermal cross section, which is in depending on units. So if you want to use uh, these uh, centimeter cube over second units is three times 10 to the minus 26. Uh, if you want centimeter square is 10 to the minus 36. And if you want pico barn is approximately one pico barn. So uh, depending which uh, type of uh, um, units you are used to, you can choose your own. And you see that it's a pretty large cross section at the end. And if you want to see what would be the scattering you expect, uh, you can also compute it quite simply, for example, from an effective theory. So um, using, for example, the exchange of a Z boson, you can ju just use the Fermi coupling and you see that the cross section you would expect 
is actually smaller. So it's a 10 to the minus two, the pico barn, plus, uh, of course, some suppression which could come from the coupling to the Z, which we don't know in principle for a generic model. Of course, for a, a neutrino that we, uh, we discussed yesterday, the heavy neutrino, then this coupling would be fixed and it's actually order one. So you would expect a, a coupling which is pretty large. Sorry, uh, um, a cross section which is not so small. Uh, on the other hand, you could also have an exchange of the Higgs boson and you could again uh, do an effective coupling um, computation and you see that in this case you have um, the, the exchanges um, connected to the mass of the Higgs, which we now know. So we can compute it and you get here a 10 to the minus 8 pico barn multiplied again by the square of the coupling and uh, this is also a model dependent parameter. But the ballpark, even if the coupling is order one, you have a much more suppressed um, scattering. And indeed, uh, this is exactly the region where we are exploring now, or we have already explored. So the Z scattering is actually here on top. So this one is actually the plot of uh, some of the constraints already so a few years ago. Uh, I kept this one because it goes uh, to, to the relatively high range. And nowadays, of course, the limits are gone down, so the, the plots are moved. Uh, but this one is the mass of the WIMP with respect to this cross section. And you see here the limits. And the limits uh, goes uh, in this shape. This is exactly connected to the expression I had before. So the, um, this, uh, this point about the, the um, reduced mass is what tells you what is the, the mass where you have the strongest sensitivity. And this is the mass where the mass of the nucleon is equal, or the dark matter mass is equal to the ma uh, mass of the nucleon. And then uh, for lower masses, you start to lose uh, kinetic energy uh, and therefore you start to go towards the threshold. And this is exactly the behavior you see here that here, uh, in some sense, it goes up very quickly because in some sense, you start to move the kinetic energy below threshold. On the other hand, on the high uh, mass range, uh, you have this other uh, expression, this, uh, you have this density divided by the mass. So of course, the largest the mass, the smaller is the density in numbers, uh, because of course, the number, the, the raw, uh, the, the energy density is fixed of the dark matter. So you see that uh, you have less events just because you have less number of, of particles around. And this is exactly this dependence which goes slowly uh, up uh, in the mass, but it's not a very strong effect. So the strongest effect is either the threshold effect, which uh, gives you this, this very, very fast rise. And uh, the thing I wanted to show you are the scales. So this Z cross section I talked before is actually up here. So it's already excluded. And also the thermal cross section would be even higher. So in that sense, now we are already exploring uh, beyond uh, what was expected from the thermal argument. On the other hand, uh, remember, you have always these couplings here. So these couplings are unknown. So in that sense, uh, you can uh, still live also with the suppression of the uh, cross section. And for the Higgs, this is the reference, if you want, uh, value of the cross section, which is um, quite uh, small and, and was starting to be explored around the 2012. And now, of course, we have explored it even further. So that this is, in some sense, is also what uh, brought actually quite strong constraints on a class of model, which is called the Higgs portal model. So this is one of the simplest model you could think of, where the dark matter just couples to the Higgs uh, particle. You write the coupling usually as Higgs uh, H dagger H, so the Higgs uh, modulus squared, if you want, uh, couple to either a, a boson, uh, so squared, or a, a psi bar psi, so a um, fermion squared, or even a vector particle squared. And uh, from that interaction, you try to really have uh, all the dark matter. So the, the dark matter is connected to the scattering of the um, with the Higgs. And in that sense, these uh, sets uh, more or less uh, the coupling. So that then you can have a prediction, a very clear prediction for the scattering uh, that you would expect in a, a direct detection experiment. And this is exactly what is shown here, for example, for a fermion, a vector, and a scalar. And here you have the, the constraints at that time, which were already cutting out quite some parameter space. And now, of course, the constraints has gone down and uh, uh, gave, given you quite uh, stronger uh, limits so that in, in a quite the intermediate range of masses, this type of models is already excluded. Okay, and uh, 
And in that sense, uh, this is again a combination of different limits because for the small masses, you also have limits from the invisible Higgs CK, so from collider perspective. And at larger masses, you have the limits from direct detection, which constrains very strongly this type of models. Uh, just to show, here are the new bounds, uh, for example, by xenon one ton, um, and here Lux and Panda X. So we have gone down to 10 to the minus 46 uh, centimeters square, uh, gaining uh, with respect to here, now here in Pico Barn. So I have to, so here it was 10 to the minus 44. So we have two orders of magnitude more uh, exclusion at the peak value. And here, of course, as I said, the peak here of the sensitivity is always connected to the mass equal to the mass of your um, of the element of your detector. And of course, or xenon, uh, then you are uh, here at about, uh, yeah, so 50, 60 or so GeV. Of course, in the future, you have uh, the possibility to do even further uh, experiments and go even lower in this cross section. And uh, here is the, a slide uh, taken from the Darwin study. Darwin is a kind of ultimate uh, dark matter experiment, which uh, is supposed to go practically touching this atmospheric neutrino background and also the, the solar neutrino background. So the problem of direct detection of dark matter is that at the moment, these detectors have practically no background apart from, okay, radioactivity and uh, things like that. But there are at least um, no particles which would compete uh, if you are able in some sense to exclude all these uh, known uh, background which are local. Um, you are uh, able pra practically to run an experiment with no background. But of course, at a certain point, the neutrinos will also scatter against uh, your detector at the sufficient level that they will give you a signal. So you will get a signal from neutrinos, both the solar neutrinos and the atmospheric neutrinos. And the problem is those, those uh, neutrinos are, are practically not really uh, so easily distinguishable from a WIMP because uh, we saw in some sense a WIMP is nothing else as a heavier neutrino. You know, so uh, it's, it's the issue, how can you really disentangle the two things? So in that sense, um, these, uh, this uh, neutrino background is the problem for the next generation, if you want, of detectors. Actually, in this part here, the detectors are already touching, if you want, uh, this, uh, this uh, background. Uh, one has to say it's not as hopeless as it sounds, in the sense that, of course, for example, for the solar neutrinos, we know exactly where they come from. They come from the sun. And in that sense, uh, for example, if you could exploit also directionality, you would be able to disentangle uh, the solar neutrinos from a dark matter signal, which would come from a different direction. So also the, actually the, the signal, of course, of dark matter is supposed also to have a directionality because it comes from the opposite direction of where the, the earth is moving to. So in that sense, uh, you could, uh, if you would be able to explore the directionality, disentangle the two things. And this is also one uh, direction where there are quite a number of studies. And the last part, uh, just as I mentioned, there are also a lot of studies nowadays in this mass range below this threshold. So how far you can push this low energy threshold? Because uh, there have been also uh, studies and also the interest is such that uh, actually, as, as I already said, you could also have lighter particles if you have different or lighter cross sections so that you could actually uh, be also uh, have the dark matter also in this, uh, in this range. I mean, traditionally, if you uh, think about this Lee Weinberg bound, people always looked at dark matter above the GV, but uh, recently uh, the region below the GV has become uh, more and more uh, interesting also from the model building side. And uh, that side is what is being explored uh, now also experimentally. There are quite a number of proposals on how to extend the search below these thresholds or either to lower the threshold for the detection in the case of scattering against nuclei, but also looking at scattering with electrons or scattering with other, um, even scattering with the whole uh, phonons in the, in the in the detector and things like that. So which would actually allow you to have a different dependence on the kinetic energy. For example, for the electrons, the mass of the electrons is much lighter than the nucleon. So you have actually more uh, energy transfer if you have a lighter dark matter candidate. Um, and uh, therefore, in some sense, it's a, uh, it's a very active uh, place uh, to look for and to, to have and develop new experiments. 
Okay, so I see I have the last five minutes. So let me jump very quickly to two slides about the collider part. Uh, of course, as I said, the collider part would try to produce the dark matter in a collider and have a particle which recoils so that you can see that there is something going on in the collider. Now, to do this, of course, uh, you usually need to know how the dark matter couples to the uh, proton or to the... Um, yeah, so in practice, for example, you would have E plus minus or proton-proton or, or uh, uh, annihilation or, uh, sorry, scattering. You would have the collider giving you the dark matter. And then, as I said, the signal is seeing a particle of the standard model going in one direction and nothing in the other direction. Um, the, um, the way to study these, of course, there are two different ways you can do it. Either you have a model and you compute what is the rate of production, or you try to do it in an effective theory uh, setting. And this has been actually very, very active from the 2000s until today. Uh, all possible uh, operator to look at these operators in an effective way. So you, you see here these blobs, which are uh, not very well defined or not completely UV defined operators uh, between quarks and dark matter, for example, and with emission, of course, uh, for example, of initial state radiation. Uh, but you could have also in some cases uh, also uh, emit radiation from, um, from the final state or from depending on what the nature of dark matter is. Of course, effective field theory are fine if you use them in the uh, direct detection, so at low energy. Uh, when you go at the LHC, uh, it's not always clear you can use these effective models. Indeed, that has been also explored uh, quite some time ago already. The fact, especially, for example, you have an S channel exchange of a particle, and if this goes on a resonance, uh, then the rates you would estimate from the effective theory does not match the, the full uh, model rate. And indeed, you have uh, here is, for example, a signal. In some cases, you overestimate or underestimate your signal. But of course, uh, with also the LHC collaboration has started to really keep track of these and do uh, analysis which are uh, taking care of that. For example, here you see that you start to have also as a degree of freedom, not only the dark matter, but also the mediator. So this vector mediator or axial mediator. And in that case, of course, you can make sure that the mass of this mediator either is uh, large enough to use the effective theory, or if it is not, then you have to use the insocet, keep the mediator as a degree of freedom in your, uh, in your uh, model. So here, for example, would be the um, spin independent vector uh, operator. That's how you write it as an effective theory. And of course, as I said, if this scale is the, the mass of the mediator, if you have really the mediator on shell, you would have actually to take into account really the, the real exchange of this mediator, which is nowadays being done in these what are called simplified model. So these are models where you take just the dark matter plus a mediator and nothing else in some sense and try to describe uh, the interaction at the LHC. And for these cases, uh, there are quite some uh, limits. Um, the limits uh, are often also plotted uh, together with the direct detection limits, as you see here. And uh, here you see immediately that the colliders are usually not really uh, competitive with the, uh, with the limits from direct detection in the case of vector uh, mediators. Um, but they are actually for the axial vector mediator. And this is because the vector axial mediator gives you actually spin dependent scattering. So I didn't have time, actually I had uh, prepared uh, to discuss uh, this difference between spin independent and spin dependent. Um, I can do it tomorrow in the discussion if there are questions about it. Um, but this points to the fact that um, the collider can in this case uh, give you constraints which are in some sense um, uh, as strong as the one of direct detection. On the other hand, they are always complementary in the sense that at collider, you can cover any mass of the dark matter. So even the lighter ones, uh, the only problem you have is it, if it is too heavy, you cannot produce it. So in some sense, you have a problem at high masses and you can uh, put constraints at low masses in the direct detection in case is, is the, exactly the opposite. At low mass, you have the threshold effects and the higher mass, you have just a very weak uh, weakening. And I finish here with the last plot, which is also very recent by Atlas, where again, they concentrated on the axial vector case because it's the one, as I said, where they have actually the chance to be much stronger than the direct detection. And you see here, uh, you can put constraints um, for this simplified model, of course, uh, which are a couple of orders of magnitude stronger than the direct detection. And I think I will finish here because I am already at one o'clock.
And I will just ask if there are any questions. Uh, I have one question. Uh, could you please go to page 60? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes, about this um, a diagram at the, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, for the, for example, for the NFW uh, dark matter profile, uh, it's um, it's actually divergent uh, at, at, at the center, right? This, uh, yes, this... it is, but you have also there to take into account the, uh, the resolution of the detector. So, of course, the detector will not have a point-like resolution, and then mm -hmm. uh, you integrate over that, you get a final uh, number also at the, at the zero. Ah, uh, okay. But of course, it is in principle. If you would have an infinite precision of your detector, also from the spatial, uh, spatial, um, the, you would uh, here have a have a singularity. Yes. Okay. Okay. 